morning, everyone. Buna Dimineta. It's an absolute honor to be here today, and what an incredible opening of the conference. Both Alex, it was an absolute pleasure to hear you speak and talk more about the community that you're bringing here together. I want us to give another round of applause to Alex and the rest of the team. And Anjana, the questions that you asked, I had to procrastinate on them like two weeks, <laughs> or almost one. And the one that really made me ponder was, when AI will make our, our jobs redundant? It wasn't if AI will make. So I had to kind of go back and think about my career, what am I gonna do? <laughs> because if Anjana says it, then it's definitely true. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me today. I'm super, super excited to, th to talk about rethinking reactivity. Uh, some of you that are part of the Angular uh, community, you are already aware of some of the work that we've done there. In fact, this morning I was greeted with, Angular signals are awesome. So I'm gonna talk a bit about that um, and hopefully it will be a good, a good topic of conversation for the alternative stage that we're gonna uh, meet at later today as well. I absolutely loved the theme of these conference, of this conference this year. Um, it really made me sit back and reflect and think about what was going on in our web dev journey in 2013, 10 years ago. And it actually, I, I ended up spending way too much time validating my own experience as a web dev during that time. So in searching through the like, archives of the internet, uh, I found this article from the modern web where they talk about what was going on in 2013. And you can see here one of our former colleagues, Burke Holland, saying that 2013 was the year of AngularJS. And there was no doubt about that. Uh, in 2013, we saw a tectonic shift in frameworks towards declarative UIs. So that was something that was going on in 2013. You'd almost think that, oh, are we talking about today, except for the AngularJS part, but yeah, that is something that we're still continuing to talk about. Uh, for Aurelio, the big thing was new front-end tools like Grunt and Bauer and Yeoman. They were helping developers at that time really automating um, some of their tasks and thinking about how they uh, build their web applications. Um, and like Aurelio says here, they have taken developers by storm and have heavily changed the way that they approach their work. And finally, Eric was saying that responsive design is now mainstream. That was interesting and it definitely made me uh, remember some of the, my own experiences back then. It was also the year when <laughs> the mean stack was introduced with the promise to improve performance both for the software as well as for the developers working on that. And fun fact, this blog post and the mean stack was introduced on my birthday. So <laughs> you have a homework now. <laughs> In the, rest, in the next of the decade, we saw so much change happening in uh, our ecosystem. Uh, starting with React, which was open sourced in 2013, so 10 years ago. Um, VS Code being introduced two years later in 2015, which was also the year when uh, ES6 was published and brought us arrow functions and let and const. And it really set the foundation for uh, new versions being released or published on a yearly basis. Uh, the web space continued to, continue to grow and grow, and we, we've seen frameworks like Vue being released in 2014, uh, Svelte, SolidJS, Quick, Nuxt and Nuxt meta frameworks. There's a lot going on, and we also witnessed over the past decade the rise of TypeScript and literally JavaScript eating the world, right? <laughs> in her awesome talk, um, Sarah Dresner talks about how innovation doesn't happen in isolation. And how many of today's frameworks are actually built on top of yesterday's learnings. And we don't know yet what the third wave will look like, or what it looks like, but we're already seeing some things forming. We're seeing more and more meta frameworks 
coming up and showing up and building robust frameworks that we can use um, in order to be productive. We're seeing um, things like quick open sourcing and popularizing um, resumability. And we're seeing uh, frameworks like Stolid.js leading the wave of fine-grained reactivity and bringing back signals. So kind of diving deeper into reactivity, uh, we actually see a convergence towards similar reactivity primitives. And it's not a new thing. Those of you that have been web developers for quite a while, you're probably familiar with Knockout.js. And they were actually the first ones to introduce observables and this concept of um, using signals to um, drive the reactivity of the framework. And they also were the first ones who introduced in web frameworks the concept of computed properties and derived state. Obviously, reactivity and reactive uh, languages have existed for quite a while, and um, interfaces, uh, graphical user interfaces, have been using uh, reactive languages for decades. Um, but this is when we see some of this coming up in uh, web frameworks. And we're also seeing Vue uh, introducing proxies. We're seeing Svelte moving reactivity into the compiler, and Solid is really creating this new wave of let's all think about signals and leading the way there. Um, and we have Preact, Quick, um, and Angular now starting to use signals as primitives for the web framework reactivity. And if you're wondering what is reactivity, it is a declarative way to express the propagation of change, which is very generic. Um, maybe uh, definition. Um, so <laughs> maybe diving a, a bit deeper into an example, um, this is a classical example where we talk about uh, uh, reactivity. Um, we take a spreadsheet, and if we update um, Mark's last name, you would also expect in a spreadsheet that the full name is updated as well. And that's because the spreadsheet knows that full name actually depends on first name and last name. And that's exactly what reactivity allows us to bring to the web. Uh, reactivity enables a framework to understand change propagation through dependency tracking. And that's a simple example, uh, but what about when you have uh, one or more values that you have to track? Uh, you can think of values or state as nodes in a reactive graph, and they rely and update based on one another. If one value is changed, the dependency is tracked, and the observable state notifies any of the derived values which depend on this value. And when these values change, a side effect like a render is triggered. So that's when we actually uh, synchronize the state of your application to the UI itself that the user will see. And this change propagation only notifies the dependent values. So what that means in practice is that with reactivity, whenever certain values don't change, then there's no notification uh, going on. And we're going to dig into this a bit later. Um, but I want to... Take a step back, and I mentioned, uh, like Anjana mentioned, that I work on the Angular team, um, and we've actually gone through an entire process uh, and design review over the past year or so, um, looking at our reactivity and iterating on that. So we looked at what decisions we made 10 years ago, and what are some of the trade-offs that they present. Obviously, we have this like body of work and. Um, immense number of applications that are running on Angular, and all of you in the community have provided feedback on a consistent basis around what works for you and what doesn't. So using all of that information, we looked back at what were our design choices and what kind of challenges do they present for users and how can we iterate on them. Um, Alex and Jeremy actually gave a talk at ng-conf uh, last year, which focuses on all five uh, different topics that we looked at. Uh, today, I'm going to focus mostly on automatic global change detection. And this is one of, the, one of the key decisions that went into how we think about uh, change detection, is that your view state can live anywhere. And not only it can live anywhere, 
but you can mutate it anywhere as well. So looking at this code example, um, you can literally uh, kind of view your user's profile biography directly in your template. And notice that there's no getters, there's no parentheses, there's no dot value. Like, it is exactly your object, and it's a nested object. Uh, the same is true for uh, user addresses. It's an array, and you can directly access it in your template. And you can mutate that state deeply inside of that object. So here I can set biography to a new biography. I can add and remove items from the array, and everything just works. Um, and that's like a fantastic experience. That's one of the reasons why I loved uh, using Angular the first time that I did. Um, and it's kind of unique to Angular, but it comes with some costs. Um, and mostly they're associated with performance and uh, complexity. Um, and these costs weren't necessarily anticipated in the original design. So we talked about how state can live anywhere, and you don't have to tell Angular when you're changing that state, when you're mutating that state. And that means that every single time that the state updates, Angular has to figure out what has changed. So it has to do like compare the previous version of the state with the current version of the state and figure out what parts of the state has changed for you. And it's even more complex than that. Um, in order for us to be able to reflect those changes in the UI, we also have to uh, find out when things have changed. And we have an answer for that. You might be familiar with it. Uh, it's called Zone.js. The Zone.js is basically responsible for telling Angular when something might have changed in your application. And notice that I'm saying might have changed because it's not that uh, Zone.js will trigger only when your state is changing. It will trigger on every single browser event because that's what we're doing with Zone.js. We are monkey patching browser APIs so we can intercept uh, the instances where your state might be changing. So we monkey patch things like event listeners, set timeouts, XHRs, basically any browser API which takes a callback. So that gives us this uh, statement that on any browser event, Angular will scan the whole application for changes which has an immediate consequence. It means that Zone.js is a non-negotiable part of your application, uh, which in turn means that we have to pay the cost of actually loading Zone.js at the beginning of your, like the startup of your application. Um, and it's, it's not a big library, but it's not a small one either. It's 16 kilobytes that we have to download and parse. Um, and monkey patching isn't free either, because at the startup of your application, we actually have to go and execute that code that monkey patches your browser um, APIs. So we put our thinking caps, and we kind of thought through, okay, what are the properties of reactivity that, we, that would be ideal, knowing all of what we know today? What are the things that would be important so that our users can write applications the way that we think it's best. And we've defined a set of goals that actually are uh, listed in the Angular RFC. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with this, but we published a series of um, GitHub discussions, requests for comments, where we outlined the direction for the new reactivity system and we asked for feedback from the community. Um, and so these are some of the goals that we have listed there. So we wanted Angular to have a clear and unified model for how data flows through your application. We also wanted to bring in built-in support for declarative state. This is a common request that we get on GitHub, and we know that a lot of frameworks already have support for this ever since Knockout.js. Um, we also wanted to reduce the or have more fine-grained updates, um, maybe at the granularity of the components or even uh, lower. We wanted to, we know that RxJS is very important to our community, so we wanted to make sure that we have a smooth interoperability story between uh, this new reactivity system and RxJS so that folks can continue to use RxJS in the way that they, um, they it makes them productive. 
um, we wanted to build a viable path towards writing uh, fully zoneless applications so that we reduce um, the cost of starting um, your applications. And we wanted to simplify some of the framework concepts so that it's easier to get started with Angular. And this is where we're introducing Angular signals, which are now in developer preview as part of V16. And as I mentioned, one of our major motivations behind introducing signals is actually simplification. And let's dig into what that actually means. With this new reactivity, uh, we're, which hopefully simplifies your development process, we're introducing three different primitives, uh, the signal, computed, and uh, effects. And a signal is a value that is capable of notifying or signaling that it has changed. So it sends a notification to the reactive context to say when it has changed and what it has changed. And remember, that's, that was part of the complexity that we had to work through both with the global change detection and with zone.js. Going back to our spreadsheet example, uh, first and last name would, in this case would be signal values, uh, which are ready to notify the reactive context if they change in the future. And in many situations, you might find yourself deriving state from existing values with a goal to have the derived state update when the dependent values change automatically and be able to describe that dec declaratively. So with computed, this new primitive that we're introducing, we can declaratively express that full name actually depends on first name and last name. And we expect it to be updated automatically whenever any of the two changes. There are also times when we might want to execute arbitrary code whenever a signal changes. So with effect, you can, write, you can execute side effect full code um, as a result of those changes. And there's a couple of use cases that you might consider using effects for. One is like doing things like triggering network requests or um, performing rendering actions or reading or mutating the DOM after Angular has finished rendering. So in our spreadsheet, we want to log to the console when last name has changed. Um, and we want to do that in a effect because that's an IO operation. A more, there's, there's this demo that we've built that includes a more uh, powerful example of these three primitives at work. Um, and this is a Cypher game that I hope you're going to play whenever you get the chance. Um, ciphers are systems for encrypting and decrypting data. Um, and in this demo, we are basically decoding a secret message by dragging and dropping clues to solve a cipher. Um, and you can even customize the message and share the URL um, with your friends and update your secret messages. Um, so let's dive into how you actually do that using signals. Um, this particular app has three different signals which are provided in two root services. First, we define a cipher signal, uh, which is a randomly generated mapping of key and value pairs from one letter of the alphabet to the encoded letter of the alphabet. That's like part of your secret message. And we'll use this to encode the actual message that you're defining. We also have a decoded cipher signal of the key and value pairs that you've already successfully decoded. And finally, we have a super secret message um, that is a signal and defines the secret message that we're decoding. A unique and powerful attribute of Angular signals design is that we're introducing reactivity everywhere. So we've defined the signals once in our services, and we can use them in templates, we can use them in pipes, in components, in other services, basically anywhere you write application code. And they're not limited or bound to your component uh, scope. So here we're using the super secret message in the template to help display the message in the screen of the game there. But we're also using the same signal across multiple components classes to create the URL to set a new uh, super secret message um, and anything else that might be needed. Now, we talked about computed signals, and those allow us to derive state um, and update that in, in response to changes in our signals. Um, and in our application, okay, let me see if I can play this. 
In, in our application, we can go ahead and actually change the secret message and generate a new encoded message that you can then share uh, the URL with um, other folks as well. Um, and this is a computed property. Okay. So our secret message depends and is computed from our super secret message and the cipher signals. And then we also have the solved message which decodes the secret message with the cipher into what the user actually sees on the screen using the decoded cipher. You can already see that here we're building a graph of dependency which models how data flows in your application. And Angular can use the notifications from signals to know which components need to be change detected. Or to execute effect functions, which you define. And here we're using effect to uh, launch confettis when you are actually uh, solving this um, secret message. Go ahead and have a look. You can find the demo code here at the URL and play with the actual um, uh, game, it's actually a stack blitz, so um, it will run in the browser for you. With precision updates and lightweight dependencies, Signals enables you to build faster applications by default. Um, it unlocks better performance by minimizing the work that Angular performs to keep your DOM up to date with really precise writes. So Signal gives fine-grained information about which parts of the models of the model have, have changed and Angular, in turn, understands which signals are used in the different parts of the component tree. So that we can only synchronize the components with the DOM that have changed. And change detection runs when and only when a signal in a template has notified Angular that it has changed. Signals are also a very small library, two kilobytes or so, um, and they're fast. And there's no requirement to actually load third-party dependencies, and there's no upfront uh, startup cost to using uh, signals. And Angular version 16 is only the beginning. Uh, our team is committed to experimentation and feedback as we continue to build on this new reactivity system um, and evolve into the future. And since we're Angular, we are committed to the same model of backwards compatibility that we've always had. Um, we want you to be able to use signals in your application, no matter how you currently manage state. And that's part of the reason why we actually partnered and worked very closely with some of your favorite state management libraries, so that they have support for signals from day zero. Um, so here you might already know that NGRX and um, RX Angular have already introduced support for Angular signals, and you can use it today. It is in developer preview today, and we're excited for you to try it out and share feedback with us. Um, and this is only the first step. We also plan to do over the next few months work in to include support for reactive inputs and outputs and queries, um, and enabling fully zoneless applications. Throughout the process, we'll make sure that we continue to publish requests for comments and make sure that we incorporate the feedback that you have and understand better how this impacts the developer experience that you're aiming for. Reactivity gives you three powerful primitives, signals, computed, and effects. And they enable you to simplify your development with conceptual simplicity, with familiar concepts, and with first-class support for interoperability. They will, you will constantly be on the optimal path for building faster applications by default with precision updates and powered by reactivity everywhere. We're really excited to see what you'll build using Angular Signals. So we recommend you ng update to v16 um, and uh, explore some of the demos that we've built as well. Um, there's a workshop that Alex and Emma have built um, for getting started with Angular Signals. And I guess that's my signal to wrap up. Uh, you've been a fantastic audience, and I'm looking forward to our uh, conversation at the alternate stage as well. Thank you so much.